Eight-year-old Shasta Groney is in a fight for her life. Abducted by heartless serial killer Joseph Edward Duncan, she is now on her own after watching him murder her family and gun down her nine-year-old brother, Dylan. And now, only days later, Duncan turns his sights on her. He was like, how do you want to die? And he was like, just like, you have the choice to be strangled or you have the choice to be shot like your brother and that one's gonna be quicker. Like, you won't feel pain. I felt like if um, I had chose the strangulation that I might have a chance to talk him out of what he was doing. And so he laid me on the ground and put a rope around my neck and he just pulled it super, super tight. And I remember everything like going, it was like going white, kind of like black and white and I just couldn't really see anything anymore. But I had worked up enough breath to say, please don't jet. Jet is Duncan's nickname. And now, in a desperate last-second gamble to save herself, she calls it out loud. I noticed that when I would use that name with him, it would, like, soften a little bit, like it would soften him. And um, he's like, what did you say? And I, and he had let go, and everything was starting to come back, and I was just really dizzy. Somehow, this helpless child finds her way deep into the twisted mind of a crazed killer and switches off his murderous rage. I said, please don't, Jet, and he just he started crying and he was like, I can't do this. Then, after four long weeks at the camp, he makes an offer that she can scarcely believe. He had said that he wanted to take me home. He's like, I want to take you to meet my mom. Would you meet her? And I had said yes. I'll meet your mom. Approaching Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, they stop at a convenience store in Kellogg where a surveillance camera captures them on tape. This is you mm -hmm. in the surveillance. Do you, do you remember that moment? Yeah, I do. Who's, who's that little girl? I was scared and um, just lost. And I remember just holding on to hope, but still feeling like there wasn't going to be any. They get closer to home, but Shasta knows that a single wrong move can trigger the monster in Joseph Duncan. He drove past my school, like my elementary school that I went to. He drove past one of my best friend's houses. And just, I remember thinking like, okay, I can jump out right now and just go knock on her door and, you know, just beg her to help me. As you were driving into Coeur d'Alene, did you see the first missing billboard? Yeah, I remember seeing it and I remember feeling sad because I had my brother's face on it and he wasn't with me anymore. I remember like thinking about how my family was, you know, probably looking for us. They reach Coeur d'Alene around 2 a.m. and stop at the local Denny's to eat. Waitress Amber Dean takes their order, but she doesn't take her eyes off Shasta. They were my only table at the time and I immediately recognized her. He was um, what I call dead in the eyes. No emotion, no nothing. His entire world revolved around her. She didn't speak without his permission. Something about the dynamic between the two, it set the hairs on the back of your neck up immediately. There was something just not okay. Shasta orders a milkshake. Amber heads for the phone. I'd spoken to my manager. I said, you know, I think we should probably call Coeur d'Alene PD. I'm pretty positive that's, that's Shasta Groney over there. I'll take full responsibility. I'll, I'll pay for their meal if I'm wrong. We need to get somebody up here. Amber stalls the food order while manager Linda Olson makes the call. I've got a little girl here with a tall gentleman, and she looks so much like this. Uh, Shasta. OK, are they still in the building? And we're not sure. You know, I just, she looks so much like her, and I have just. All right, we'll have someone start that way. So you're sitting at the table across from Duncan and you see a police officer enter mm -hmm. the restaurant. What was your first thought? I was scared. I remember thinking that Joseph Duncan, he's so smart. And I was like, so even if, even if they know that I'm with him, that maybe he will have an excuse and they'll just leave and they won't think that anything was wrong. Uh, you know, that's just my eight-year-old mind thinking. But Shasta can hardly believe what happens next. Um, the cop had asked me what my name was, and I had looked at Joseph Duncan, and he said, you can tell him. So Joseph Duncan actually told me, you can tell him. And so um, I had, you know, said Shasta, and that's when he had, you know, told Joseph Duncan to stand up. And so it was just 
<laughs> After that happened, I was just, it was just almost like a sigh of relief. Police take Duncan outside and ask Amber to sit with Shasta. I said, Danny, is, is your brother in the car? And she said, no. He's in heaven with mom and dad, I think is what, what it was. And I was, I just, you know, my heart kind of broke. And I just held her and let her know that she was safe. She was going to see her dad again soon. And it was all over. Shasta's long nightmare is finally finished, thanks largely to her own will to survive. Shasta had an amazing ability to somehow communicate with Mr. Duncan and build some sort of a bond with him that I think protected her, even to a point control him to some degree. We believe that it was Shasta that convinced Mr. Duncan to stop at the Denny's restaurant and basically orchestrated her own rescue by doing that. Joseph Duncan was found guilty in the murders of Shasta's family and confessed to three prior child killings. He is sitting on death row in a federal penitentiary. But for Shasta, being a survivor hasn't been easy. For the longest time, I was so scared to just go and be anywhere by myself. Some of the choices that I had made to try to cover pain and hide the pain and deal with it in, you know, not so appropriate ways. Today, she's moved on with her life, with a baby on the way and looking to a bright future after reuniting with her biological father. I think that we have a super strong relationship, especially after um, everything I went through. It brought us really close together. And, you know, now he's just, I mean, he's really excited to to be having another grandbaby. <laughs> but Shasta still hasn't forgotten Joseph Duncan's last haunting request as he was led away by police. I remember him asking me, when you get older, promise me that you will come see me wherever I am. And I said, I promise. I have actually um, talked to a couple people about actually making that happen. So when you sit in front of him at some point in your future, what do you want to say to Joseph Duncan? I don't hate him for the things that he's done. I, I forgive him, actually. At some point in my life, I had to come to the conclusion that I'm always going to, if I don't forgive him, then he's going to control my life in, in some way or another. He's always going to be in my thoughts. I still have the intentions of facing him again and telling him this is what you did to him and my family and this is how I feel about it, you know. But also, I want him to know that I'm doing good things with my life too so that he, he knows that he doesn't control my life and that he doesn't affect me anymore. I mean, that really is a phenomenally mature philosophy for someone who has endured so much and is still a teenager. Up next, we ask the question, is it a good idea for Shasta to see Joseph Duncan again? We'll have clinical psychologist Dr. Seth Myers here to answer all those tough questions about this case. That's next.